Hello, this is Professor Farhad Zafezi from the Light for Sight Foundation in Switzerland. My topic is Saving Sight Through Keratoconus Screening in Children with Down Syndrome, the Light for Sight Foundation. These are my financial interests. Now, when looking at a human cornea, this cornea has a certain curvature. The cornea is the outermost part of the eye. And this curvature should remain the same between birth and death. It should never change. What can change throughout life is the size of your eyeball. Now, we can measure the cornea and a perfect cornea would look like this in 3D, like the surface of a ball. Now, the entire ball could be too big and then you are short-sighted and need glasses and see really well or the eye remains too small and then the cornea is, uh, has a different curvature and you need glasses again to see well. Now many patients will tell you, doctor, I have astigmatism and normal astigmatism is totally fine to have. It means nothing else but the eye or the cornea not having a perfect ball-like shape but the surface rather looks like an American football. But everything is symmetric one to another. This is the 3D image and this is how astigmatism would look in a 2D map again. If you have astigmatism, you wear glasses and everything will be fine. You see 100%. Now, keratoconus is a condition where the astigmatism is not regular anymore. And what happens is the cornea bulges forward, gets thinner and thinner and can even burst. And so here, if I plot this topographical image, nothing is regular anymore. This is irregular astigmatism, glasses, cannot correct for this and this is the 2d image of a typical keratoconus you should know that keratoconus is the most frequent global reason for legal blindness in children and adolescents there is no other eye disease that makes more eyes legally blind which means less than five percent of visual acuity with the best pair of glasses is keratoconus a rare disease? If you open up a textbook, you will in many instances still read that keratoconus occurs in 1 in 2,000 patient people in the normal population. Now this number comes from a seminal 1986 paper that had been published in our American Journal of Ophthalmology and this was a nearly 50 year longitudinal epidemiological study performed in Minnesota in the US. So the study was published in 1986, 50 years of study, which means the first patients had been included in the early 1930s, almost a century ago. And you can imagine that the ways of detecting the disease almost 100 years ago were quite primitive. Now, today, keratoconus is not really classified as a rare disease anymore. Why? because with the upcoming of much more sophisticated technology we are able to detect the disease in earlier stages but also we learned that on a global level the populations do not always behave like the one in Minnesota and um, the global hotspot for the disease is the Middle East and um, the Maghreb states. We have performed um, a study in Riyadh with, uh, with a little more than 1,000 patients, children and adolescents and found a prevalence that was 1 in 21 patients, almost 5% of the normal population. Now if you plot the studies that had been performed in the past 20 years, then you will see that our study from 2018 has the highest ever reported prevalence using the most modern equipment in a hotspot state and our prevalence is almost 100 times higher than the one initially reported in 1986. In other words, keratoconus is quite common and that puts it into a very different perspective. What we have started with our foundation, which is present in 42 countries now, we picked 14 of our ambassador sites and are conducting a global prevalence study on four continents to better understand the regional variations in disease prevalence. 
What about detecting keratoconus? This is a modern device that is able to detect the disease. You will find it in all centers with good infrastructure. And uh, this is also especially suited to take pictures in children down to the age of four to five years or depending on the level of compliance. This is then the image we detect and a particularity is that the disease keratoconus can be very aggressive at young age. This is a young teenager that has progressed from 80% of remaining visual acuity to 40% within 12 weeks only. So it is key to identify these kids really early and treat them as soon as possible. And treatment nowadays is available. This treatment modality is called corneal crosslinking and was established in Switzerland almost 20 years ago and has become a global standard nowadays with CE mark and FDA approval and an estimated 200,000 procedures per year. I'm very proud to be one of the four ophthalmologists from the original group that has established the entire research and technology 20 years ago. And ever since, we are at the forefront of this development. One particular element is before this therapy of corneal crosslinking had been established, many patients needed corneal transplantation as an ultimate means to exchange a cornea but you always try to avoid transplantation in a young patient because these transplants never last a lifetime. Now, since the establishment of cross-linking, the number of corneal transplantations has dropped by 50% in Europe and most probably also in other states, as, uh, other areas of the world, but for Europe we have precise data and numbers. This is a nine-year-old that I've treated some years ago and the first big study on pediatric crosslinking comes from our group. This was back in 2012 and we also saw that if left untreated, most children, almost 90%, will progress in the disease. So ever since, the, uh, the best practice model in children is if you detect the disease, you treat immediately and then you win the game. So early detection and early treatment are key. Are there particularities in Down syndrome? Well, we all know that Down syndrome is related to certain changes in connective tissues and the human cornea is nothing else but connective tissue collagen. So it is not surprising that the prevalence of keratoconus in, in people with Down syndrome is up to 8%. But the big dilemma we are facing is that many of these cases, a huge amount of these cases, remains untreated. In fact, we started the whole Light for Sight Foundation because uh, back in 2007 or 8, my wife, who is on the strategic management side of ophthalmology, asked me, uh, asked me after having read an article on the prevalence of keratoconus in humans with Down syndrome, she asked me, how many patients with Down syndrome have you treated so far? And at that time, we already were performing cross-linking for six to seven years. And I said, maybe one. And so we saw that there is a huge mismatch between the number of patients treated and the real prevalence. How come? One major reason can be that we need to increase public awareness for the disease and also visual acuity testing is a subjective measurement. We need the patient to collaborate and tell us what they can read in front on the table. And if sometimes compliance is reduced, then we cannot assess the function properly. And, and also there might be a bias where seeing a person with Down syndrome wearing glasses, the eye doctor or the optician might stop, uh, might be stopped at 50% of vision, thinking that, okay, the patient was not that cooperative today, might be the reason uh, for the reduced visual acuity, it was reduced compliance. Or the patient has keratoconus and nobody has detected it because we do not perform these, these measurements, these special measurements in routine examination. And that's a big uh, drawback that we are working on right now. So one big issue is creating 
public awareness on all levels, whether it be um, a journal specific to patient organizations like the one from Germany or also trade journals that are targeted to ophthalmologists, ophthalmic surgeons, as you can see here, Nikki Alfesi with the Light for Sight 21 initiative to promote detection and treatment of keratoconus in children with Down syndrome. This was six years ago. Then once you get children with Down syndrome into your consultation, you need to make sure that the surroundings are optimal for proper detection. And to do so, we have created a process we call PINCO, Process to Increase Compliance in Ophthalmology. And it is all about minimizing the stress for the child by establishing best practice models. Well, in the first uh, step, we have plotted the entire flow of a patient through a modern ophthalmological practice and then we have tried to reduce stress on all levels and with the years we have learned to take a number of measures for example short movies like the one you see on the right are already present on our website so the child can have a look at these movies together with her parents it is often the fear of the unknown that causes stress if you know what will happen on the day of examination, then the stress levels are heavily reduced. And also, as you can see on the left, we try to create a relaxed atmosphere, let the children play and explore before we start the examination. This helps tremendously. Another element is to reduce the administrative clutter. So if we need a long questionnaire to be filled out, the child will get nervous in the waiting area. We send these questionnaires to the parents beforehand so they come with a filled out questionnaire and we minimize the waiting time until we can start the examination. And finally, we learned that positive reinforcers can also help tremendously and we need to learn from others. And this is, for example, what we learned from pediatric dentists. And uh, it's just refreshing to see which measures can be taken to calm down children that are afraid of what is going to happen next. And finally, once we have proper detection, as I said before, we nowadays have a treatment that is extremely efficient. Corneal crosslinking has a success rate of up to 95%. But for uh, children with Down syndrome, special measures have to be taken and we developed the Light for Sight uh, treatment model that is based on the patient's compliance and so we have a stage-wise approach with different levels of technical settings either performed under local anesthesia or also under general anesthesia. So the whole range of a cross-linking treatment can go to the most modern easy form of treating at the stent lamp. This is also a technology that we have developed in our, in our um, um, clinic in Switzerland, just like the very first cross-linking technology 20 years ago. So we can perform the treatment in the upright position, but if we are facing a patient with heavily reduced compliance, we can also perform the same treatment in the laying position under general anesthesia. So in summary, um, we try to increase awareness for the disease keratoconus because keratoconus is the most common reason for legal blindness in children and adolescents worldwide. Screening early means early treatment and we have developed special measures in low compliance patients. And if you're interested to learn more about the Light for Sight Foundation, please visit our web website lightforsight.org. Our mission is to stop preventable blindness in children and adolescents by performing outreach, education, research and access to treatment. Thank you very much for your attention.